Anybody ever seen the movie Chariots of Fire? In 1981, it came out and uh, told the story of Eric Little. Little, or the Flying Scotsman, as he was called, is one of the most gifted and celebrated athletes Scotland has ever produced. In 1924, he was selected by the British Olympic Committee to run in the 100 meters at the Paris Olympics. The only problem was that the qualifying race for the event was to be held on Sunday. Not only was Little very fast, but he was also very religious. He was a Christian Congregationalist who believed that Sunday is the Lord's Day should be devoted to him. Sundays were reserved for worship, for service, for rest, but not for running. Now this scene that we just watched, uh, in which Little is pressured by the Royal Committee and the Prince of Wales to reconsider his decision, it actually never happened. Of course not, it's Hollywood. In fact, Little knew of the heat schedule four months in advance of the Olympics, so he had plenty of time to withdraw from the 100-meter race and retrain for the 400-meter race, which he actually went ahead and won in record time. But Little has gone down in history not just because of his speed. He's gone down in history because of his convictions. With the pressure of Olympic fame and glory coming at him, along with public expectations, it would have been very, very easy for him to make a one-time exception to his beliefs. Who knows, instead of one Olympic gold medal, he could have won two. But Little knew where his strength and speed came from. It came from the Lord. And to violate his religious convictions to run in a race would insult the very God who made him able to run in the first place. A little story raises an important question for me, for you, and for all of us. How committed are we to regular rest and worship as part of our regular routine? How committed are we to using our time to honor God? Are we committed enough to rest and worship that we'd give up a gold medal or professional advancement or greater productivity or greater success? Sure, we believe Jesus is Lord of our church. We believe Jesus is Lord of our hearts. We believe Jesus is Lord of our families, of the universe. But we, do we believe that Jesus is Lord of our time? Do we believe that Jesus is Lord of our weekends? Do we believe that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath? This is the question invited by the fourth commandment. Uh, as Jeremy said, we're in week four of our current series through rooftop, rooftop called God's Big Ten. It's a series on the Ten Commandments. Uh, the ten words of instruction that God gave the Israelites uh, just after their uh, escape, their liberation from Egypt. And these laws, these ten laws, were designed to expose Israel's need for God. They were designed to make their family and their national lives better. And they were designed to distinguish Israel from the rest of the world. And in addition to being a people who worshipped one God and one God only, which commandment is that? Put it there. The first. In addition to being a people that didn't bow down to images of idols because God was invisible and personal and could not be captured by an image or an idol. That's the second command. And in addition to being a people that treated God's name as a sacred gift, as a gift of revelation. That's the third command. In addition to all this, the Israelites were to be a Sabbath people a resting, worshiping nation. This is the fourth commandment. They were to reserve the Sabbath for God and God alone. Here's the commandment as it appears in the book of Exodus. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's the fourth commandment. It was given to the Israelites, and it's being given to us. Now, you, like me, might not be a very good Sabbath keeper. I've never really kept the Sabbath well on any day of the week. I've struggled with workaholism most of my adult life. In many respects, I'm the absolute last one who should be delivering the sermon. 
Plus, I have a lot of questions about this command, as lots of people have had over the centuries. It's not all that cut and dry. For example, some people celebrate the Sabbath on Friday and Saturday. Some people celebrate the Sabbath on Sunday. Some not at all. When should it be celebrated? Jews also had hundreds, if not thousands, of rules governing what couldn't be done on the Sabbath. Rules like don't kindle any fires. Do those rules still apply? Also, the command says we should work six days and rest one day. Many people today work five days and have a two-day weekend. Does this mean we're not working hard enough? Should we be having a different sermon right now called the work six days sermon? On the other hand, this command was given when people slept longer hours and were generally better rested because the pace of life was slower. Do we actually need three Sabbath days now instead of one? Also, it was relatively easy to keep the Sabbath in Israel when everybody else did. Is it even really possible to celebrate the Sabbath when 35% of American workers are required by their employers to work on the weekend? And how am I supposed to Sabbath? <laughs> I don't know if you realize this, but Sunday is the least restful day of the week for your, church, your beloved church staff. Can we make it up elsewhere without violating the commandment? To complicate things... The Bible says that the penalty for violating the Sabbath is what? Death. That's what the Israelites were to do with people who worked on the Sabbath. Should we be doing the same? Should we be stoning each other for not being good Sabbath keepers? If so, I only ask that I get to stone you first, then you can stone me all you want. So there are plenty of questions here. I'm not going to be able to answer all of them, nor do I even want to give a whiff of expertise here. Uh, I might be able to talk about the Sabbath, because I've done some reading, <laughs> but I, like you, have a lot to learn about how to live it. So I'll be learning along with you, this someone, as someone who struggles to stay rested. But since I'm the one talking, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to go ahead and give you a primer on the Sabbath. I want to address four basic questions about the Sabbath. First of all, what is the Sabbath? Secondly, why does God give us the Sabbath? Thirdly, when should we Sabbath? And fourthly, how should we Sabbath? What, why, when, and how? It's like I'm writing an article for a newspaper. And I'm going to be brief with the first three questions so that we can get to the fourth question, the big one, the how, because that's where I think the issue of the Sabbath becomes most practical. So let's start with the first question here. What is the Sabbath? For all intents and purposes, the Sabbath is a work stoppage. That's what the word Sabbath actually means. It comes from the Hebrew word meaning to cease. What does it mean to cease? To stop. Cease and desist. Stop. Just stop. What do we stop doing? Working. Here it is. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. So work hard six days. Do your labor, whatever your labor is. Put in six hard days. Whatever your work is, do it well, do it hard. Then stop. Set down your tools. Turn off your computer. Stop making money. Stop answering phone calls. Stop fixing stuff. Just stop. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but this is hard. Already, this is hard. It's hard to stop working. There's always a moment uh, when I'm working, and I realize that before I can go home, before I can go have dinner with my family, before I can go talk to Michelle, I have to do something, right? What do I have to do? I have to stop. I have to do that. I have to stop doing. That's hard when you're not done, and you know your project is just going to be staring you back in the face when you get back. And it's also hard when other people are depending on you and they don't necessarily share your religious convictions. Boss, I gotta go home. It's five o'clock. Why? Well, it's the Sabbath. My God and my family are expecting me. Okay, well, then you're fired. That happens one way or another. When nobody else is stopping, it's hard to stop. And this is why the Sabbath is more than just a work stoppage. It's a declaration of trust and confidence in God that no matter what we have to give up, 
gold medals, bonus pay, professional advancement, greater success, we're still going to stop working when God says we should. That's what the Sabbath is. It's a faith-based work stoppage. Secondly, why should we Sabbath? Here in the command, God tells us, he says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. One more time. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So the Sabbath command is rooted in the story of creation from Genesis. You know that story? Jason just told you about it. In the book of Genesis, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Now, I know some of you skeptics out there, welcome skeptics, are wondering right now if we should really take that story literally. If you can, set that question aside right now, because it's only indirectly related to the point. Within the story of creation, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. He worked really hard for six days. Then he stopped and rested. Now think about this. Here's a question. Was God tired? Was God breathing heavy? Did he need a break? Oh my gosh, creating all those birds really did me in. I got to go veg in front of the television. No. But God knew that nonstop work defeats the point. God himself, who needs no rest and is already filled with joy, decided to rest and enjoy the goodness of his creation. That's what he did. He sat back, looked at it, and saw that it was good. Which raises the question that if God, who needs no rest and is already filled with joy, decided to take a rest so he could enjoy his creation, if God rested, should not non-gods. We who are constantly exhausted and overworked and so devoid of joy that it makes us want to scream. The Sabbath is God's gift to his people. He believes it's so important it gets added into the Ten Commandments, listed even before do not murder. Take rests. Take rests regularly because I take rests, God says. I don't even need them. And I take them. I take 24 hours out of every 168 hours to do nothing but enjoy the goodness of my creation. You take like, you know, negative four hours of breaks per week. And you don't even do it very well. When you rest, you watch mindless television or play addictive video games or get stressed out by sports contests or take vacations that require a vacation after the vacation to recover from the vacation that wasn't really a vacation. That's not a Sabbath. A Sabbath is a rest because it's who God is and what he does. I told you a few weeks ago in our introductory sermon, I told you a little bit that that in the law, God reveals himself to us. Remember this point? You can learn a lot about the guy who wrote the laws on the refrigerator by looking at the laws. Remember this point? It was a very creative and original illustration. It was designed to elicit your memory, okay? The point was, in the law, you can learn a lot about the guy who wrote the laws. What does the fourth commandment tell us about God? It's real obvious. He's rested. He's relaxed. He's energized. He's ready to go. He's not just a worker. He plays. He's a player. And he invites us to play with him. That's why we Sabbath. Not just because it's a good idea, but because God does. Question number three, but when should we Sabbath? That's the third question. Not surprisingly, Christians like to argue about this one. Jews like to argue about what to do or not to do on the Sabbath. Christians like to argue about when to Sabbath. Every religion finds something to argue about. Now, I don't want to bore you with historical theology here, but there are three basic assumptions on when people should Sabbath. You could probably guess when they are. There's the Friday-Saturday opinion. This is called the seventh-day view, or Sabbatarianism. Want to learn a big